Tales of the Travel by Gregor J. John, a collection of bawdy short stories in two books, Tales from the Rusty Rabbit and Tales from the Bullfrog, also featuring the family Christmas tale, The Last Poinsettia. Preface and Introduction The Travel universe is a place where fantasy and reality collide, where truth breeds her lies in shadow and the dark is the brightest place to shine. All human legend, fairy tales and stories of superhuman or mutant or alien powers originate in the history of the Travel. To be Travel is to be at one with the power of the universe. To be barked is to be powerless or human. But these definitions are strictly from the Travel who despise the barked for consistently refusing to bow to them as gods. The barked, humans, don't even know they are the barked. The nine energies of the Travel universe. One, illumination, light. Two, air. Three, electricity. Four, fire. Five, water. Six, fauna, animal. Seven, flora, plant. Eight, earth and mineral. Nine, metal. The Travel have the ability to bend and manipulate energy and manifestations of defense, attack, or simple daily convenience. Most Travel have one major and one minor in energy, yet some double up in either a major or minor manifestation. Some even have a triple blend in minors. However, as rare as only in myth and legend is the chameleon energist, who has access to all nine. Geography The Travel have lived upon the earth since before any can remember, and at one time walked among the uplanders as gods. However, the humans, or Bacht, have a disease of spirit. They consistently refuse to be ruled and choose rather to rebel against their divine guides. A great migration of the Travel civilization was orchestrated at the sinking of Atlantis, which granted the Bark their desire to be left alone. Further transfers of civilization occurred throughout the latter years, and now over 80% of Travel live in caverns within the continental shelves, hundreds of feet below sea level. Some still hide their true identities and share the upland with the Bacht, but only out of necessary coexistence. Human history is littered with the interruption, interference, and sometimes the intercession of the Travel. And now to begin with Book One, Tales from the Rusty Rabbit, a collection of bawdy short stories by Gregor J. John, with chapter titles In Deep, Part One, Eight Years from the Beginning, and Continued in Legalities, Part 2, which concludes today's reading. However, The Glimpses of Life Continue in Contagion, Part 1, which occurs four years later, with Viral being Part 2 of the same, then Pocket Ninja, two years after, and then Ophelion, some twelve years later, until finally Holiday Festivities, Part 1, as another four years gone by, with Temple Festivities, Part 2, being of this end. That is until Tales from the Bullfrog. So let us begin. In Deep, Part 1, Eight Years After the Beginning. Harmonic music played lightly in the background. Here in the modern Underland Temple of Atlantis, the motivational sharing time for novices was nearly over. It had been a good sermon and struck close to home in one young girl's heart. She was as bitter as a harpy. Before you leave tonight to go your separate social ways, the preacher encouraged, why don't you stop and smile and talk to someone you've not met yet? Oh God, oh God, oh God, the young novice said in her mind, please don't let anyone talk to me. But then it happened. The guy sitting in front of her looked around hopefully and saw fresh new meat. He smiled a swaggery smile and leered over the pew. How are you doing this evening? The young novice smiled in sarcastic innocence as she checked her hydrophone bracelet and tipped the button on the stopwatch. Well, this week I left my home and my family, who are currently being threatened by extinction and eviction, and it's very possible I may never see them ever again. She smiled sweetly. The interviewer backed off the pew, bowed, and nodded sincerely as he said, Well, good luck with that. He stumbled as his knee banged against the pew corner, hindering his speedy escape. The stopwatch clicked off at 44 seconds. The sweet new novice, known only as Philly, sucked in a deep breath and reinforced her happy face as she made her way out of the crowd and up to the quiet comforts of her lonely room. 
Steam would have been pouring out her nose had it not been for the freezing temperatures that encased her heart. In a moment of weakness, in a moment where she allowed her inherited rage to take control, she threw caution to the wind and flicked on her personal flowboard. A deep-seated issue with men caused the ice to burn harder as she restored to her best and fastest mode of attack. Typically, she liked to draw them in and leave them hanging. Looking up the first on-sourcing love match page she could find, Philly filled out a profile with such flair, pizzazz, and open, vulnerable passion that no male could resist being sucked in. She wasn't about to pay to become a source member or even to go looking herself. The plan was to make them all want her, and then she could just ignore them all, never respond, never answer, and then come back and delete her profile. The problem was the picture suggestion that kept popping up to the side. When she saw his picture, she couldn't not take a second glance. She blamed pure curiosity as the reason she opened his profile briefing that was sickeningly perfect. There was no way anyone could be that brilliant. She tapped a random smiley at the top of the page, and before she knew it, a stock message was blinked off to him. Almost immediately, he flicked back to, back to her. She jumped up and turned the flowboard screen to hibernation, pacing the tiny rooms, her hands flapping in desperate attempt to try and control the building passion. The flowboard screen flickered again as a personal message tapped in. He was trying to talk to her beyond her ability to respond as it was blocked by a lack of page membership. She made a minor attempt to resist, yet still reached out to send another vague, emotive token. He understood. The title of the message he resent was a code. She saw the simplicity of the plan and easily bypassed the manacled matrix codes and hacked through to message him back. An uncoded and open communication broke through, and his charm bounded across the energy waves and hit her like a monsoon. She crumbled to the floor, his smile wavering in three-dimensional imagery, enticing her eyes that threatened to roll ecstatically back into her head. Both hands pulled at her hair and she slammed her eyes shut to block the image with no success. The novice forced herself into slow breathing, muttering quiet pleas for self-control. Tomorrow was a big test day for her temple novice class and she needed to sleep. She could not allow her innate default responses to control her behavior tonight, but her blood boiled in its habitual fashion, and pushing up to her knees, she continued begging the peace of life to fill her and release her from the agonies of the rising that threatened to overtake her senses. The three-dimensional image introduced himself as, Raffolo is the name I'm called. The image winked at her. You should offer lessons to other goddesses in writing profiles. He looked over her. Are you truly as amazing as your profile declares? Philly grinned blindly from the seat on the floor. I promise. I only speak the truth, she stated. Usually more truth than most can bear. He laughed in lusty delight. I am glad you messaged me and cracked my code. Her body began rocking and she forced a serene response. Your code was clear and precise. I thank you for its simplicity. She felt the rise build again. But I am afraid I am unable to talk just now. Perhaps later we can... She couldn't even finish her sentence. But rather hit the source button and the flowboard screen blipped black. Not again, was her only whimper, as her body quivered, allowing the chemical takeover and the bursting sweetness filled her. The marathon of contractions and convulsions exhausted her and she gave in to the pleasurable transformation. A lion's roar caused the guarding temple strategists to jump to attention. They ran along the hall, banging on the young novices' doors, waking those already asleep. Everyone was questioned, and sleepy voices answered grumpily, No, no one was practicing anything, and there was obviously a huge misunderstanding. Everyone knew the rules, and all energy practices were contained as the young students prepared for their final testing tomorrow. But when they knocked on the door of the most promising of all the new students, they found their confession. Philly, what's going on here? Secondary Officer Schmidt was shocked. Philly smiled guiltily. Oh, I'm sorry, Blue. She was quite friendly with the strategist. I couldn't sleep, and so I was on sourcing some extra research. She stepped away from the flowboard controls and closer to the young militant. I, I guess I had the volume turned up too loud. I'm done now. I promise I'll go to bed. 
Esso Schmidt had a soft heart toward the eager novice. Not only was she as lovely as all the other young girls, she was remarkably intuitive and already confirmed for early graduation. He weakened slightly. Just be sure to be alert for deep water surveying tomorrow. I will, she smiled, and waved as he closed the door. It was odd, he noticed, that her room should be so messy. It was quite unlike her. The next morning, before testing began, Philly reopened her personal message filter and heard Raffolo's final remarks. I'm off to work, his recording informed her, and there is a minor chance I may not be able to reconnect for a couple of days. She slumped on the bed, completely annoyed that such a brief interaction could create such disappointment. Raffolo's message continued. I'd like to chat with you further. Such a creature as you shouldn't be prowling second-rate matching sites. His image winked deliciously at her and flickered off. Philly growled quietly and made her way down to breakfast. Exercising and testing came in the form of guard duty. The novices were to follow S.O. Schmidt's lead and conduct sweeping surveys of the oyster farms located in the temple's river source. This required use of their newly acquired deep water skills. They were buddied up and told to check each other's breathing gear before diving off into the cavern waterways. They swam in teams out to the underwater farms. Philly and her buddy, a younger bo and rougher boy from the inner city, began their Passover in regulated style. The boy was too independent for Philly's taste as her life depended to some degree on his partnership. As she feared, he began wavering off on his own explorations instead of staying within visibility of the rest of the team. She had no choice but to stay with him and hoped they would be able to regroup without too much difficulty. Suddenly he turned to her and blew a burst of excited bubbles pointing in dramatic slowness through the dark water to some flashes of light beyond the opposite reef. Dubiously they swam to investigate. Another lone diver was there using his energized light beams to pry open some of the newly grown oysters. He already had a bulging bag of inappropriately acquired pearls. Philly's diving buddy instantly swam toward the thief, unsheathing his metal blade in a threatening manner. She held back slightly. The lone diver looked up and waved politely with one hand, while squeezing his other hand on a small siren strapped to his belt. The waterlogged siren wail caused the cavern wall behind him to come to life. Numerous sharks of all sizes suddenly descended on the three and the rougher city boy nearly disappeared in a cloud of panic-filled air bubbles. He began rapidly ascending through the finned crowd. Philly pushed anxiously through to him as quickly as she dared, but the lone diver reached his feet first and pulled him down. There was a struggle, and blood was drawn from someone. She swam in unity with the frenzying sharks, and to the city boy's surprise, she helped the lone diver drag him deeper into the blue cold. On the river floor, Philly grabbed the city boy's face and held it mask to mask with hers, and gestured a regulated pattern for his breathing. His panic settled, but fear and too much nitrogen kept his eyes bulging. She slowly helped him swim in a straight line up, pausing every five seconds to regulate his breathing. Sight of the lone diver was lost as they passed through the constantly moving grey fins and jagged teeth. By the time they reached the surface, Philly's face was red with rage. She ripped off her mask and spat the breather out in disgust. What in Hades makes you think I shouldn't gut you and feed you to those sharks? The boy wasn't sure which option was more terrifying, the sharks below or the young girl in front of him. He stuttered, what'd I do? That thief nearly drowned me. That thief regretfully saved your life. He tried to drown me, the victim sputtered. No, he stopped you from ascending too quickly so your lungs wouldn't explode. She glared at him. He continued defending his stupidity. But the sharks, Philly almost smacked him. There were grey nurse sharks, you sandal. They don't even attack the upland bark, let alone harming a travel. Esso Schmidt's head bobbed to the surface, and he queried with genuine concern, What's going on here? The boy stuttered again. We found a rutting thief and it nearly killed me. Philly sat suddenly, feeling a little lightheaded and queasy. Perhaps the counting had been off in the adrenal rush, and they had surfaced too quickly. Schmidt climbed onto the dock. We found your thief and have him caged and rising even now. The boy began babbling and suddenly threw up. 
A healing crew rushed to him and laid him on a crisp bed, preparing to take him off to the recovery quarters. Philly began feeling better with a slow breathing and waved off the healing assistance. The cage slowly rose up out of the water and the prisoner within looked completely at home, sitting casually on the bottom, holding a bloody arm bandage. Schmidt reached between the bars and tore the breather gear off, revealing that delicious smile of Raffolo's charming grin. Hello, Philly! The captive ignored his cage. Fancy running into you so soon. Raffolo? The young novice blinked the black spots away briefly, but then they took away the light. Raffolo watched her sink to the ground and pointed to the healing aids, calling out, Ah, uh, you might want to see to that one. And the story continues in Legalities, Part 2, that afternoon. The afternoon's testing excursion took the temple novices to the city of Atlantis Senate House as silent advisers for local minor judgments, and Philly, as she had recovered from her diving ordeal over lunch, was permitted back on schedule, but was warned to keep a low and restful profile. In the Travell culture, the Senate is a highly important seat of lawmaking, culture, development, and all philosophical judgment. In fact, the king's own son cannot even be named prince in one, heir to the throne, until the Senate approves the king's choice. Thus, most of the novices were frightened into silence within the austere presence of the great Senate magistrates. The first case that was brought before the courts was of a teen male charged with intent to grow unregistered farm crops the kind that gave relief to a weary mind. His lawyer, or Verital Mediator, was contending for compassion. Master Senators, Verital Mason, as was the lawyer's title and name, urged the judgment seeks to continue the, consider the teen's future. Fell has a remarkable ability with flora energy, and I insist that locking him away from nature will not aid in his reconstitution into society. The facilitating senator questioned, and what would you suggest, Veritor Mason? The long-haired truth mediator was quick with his reply. I urge you to apply the training memo that I applied and offered to the courts a week ago. Mason pulled out a rather thick block of papers. A whole reshuffling of youth philosophy applied in an open atmosphere of free acceptance that enables the multitudes of troubled urchins that run rampant in our cities to discover their abilities and play to their strengths. There it all, Mason, interrupted another toga-draped agent. Our ways are of tradition. We are not untamed barbarians like the powerless bark who inhabit this earth's service. We are gods, and the sooner the young ones step up to their responsibility, or step aside and let those who know what's best do what needs to be done, then, and only then, can we all continue in a better peace. Mason insisted. I must disagree with you. He was interrupted again. I can see that this is your bone to chew, Veritor Mason, so I will let you have one. The facilitating senator complied. For the young fell there, I will grant him freedom this once. If you will take legal responsibility for him and test your theories of reconstitution in your own home, where is that now? The senator knew full well where Mason lived, but poked his paperwork to emphasize his snobbish disdain. The, uh, Rusty Rabbit Tavern, is it? Uh, family inheritance in the low levels of this great city? Mason stammered briefly, all too familiar with the class distinction, disgust, while the young teen looked hopeful at him. So it would be my honor to, but I have been called to ply my speech in the courts. I am unsure I have time to attend to the needs of such a robust youth as fell. Then he goes to the prison hulks. The facilitations of the Senate only moved so far. I will take him. Mason had no other reply. Excellent, the Senate, Senator nodded, bragging his full control to the temple novices who were taking notes intently. Philly felt nauseous, but doubted it had anything to do with her nitrogen-packed adventure that morning. 
The facilitator continued next and read his document of court order. Lukasha Apolson for the crime of theft, fifth count. Philly sat up instantly as Raffolo was led into the room and the facilitator droned on. You are quite the frequent flyer for theft and fraud, son. The defiant charmer stated clearly, I'm not your son, or am I? There was a terse pause from the bench before the cold voice uttered, Ten years in the prison, hulks. The gavel banged, and Nukacha flinched slightly. Mason burst out, You haven't even heard his case. No need. There was a hard chuckle from numerous bench senators. We are quite familiar with this one. Mason pushed forward. How will they ever achieve height if you continue to crush them from birth? That is how a diamond is created, Veritor Mason, and that is final. The facilitator raised his gavel but froze in midair as a clear voice chimed in from the balcony of novices. Pearls! Philly was standing and the whole room stared at her in shock. Philly, sit down! The temple aides hushed the inexperienced novice in embarrassment. The Senate facilitator smiled wryly at the attractive girl. You wish to speak? he threatened. Philly faltered slightly, and her eyes blinked toward Raffolo, or Lukacha, as was his true name. He stared at her in adoring amazement, so she continued, encouraged. Pearls are created by being irritants. Silence rolled loudly across the courthouses as the audacious novice lectured. A tiny grain of sand enters the muscle of the oyster and irritates it enough so that a mucus casing hardens around the grain and grows there over years, becoming an exquisite pearl, just like this young man, is accused of stealing. Indeed, you speak the truth, my young novice, the facilitator encouraged, but, as you said... The irritant is locked away for some time before it is ready. The gavel pounded loudly and he repeated, Ten years in the prison hulks, eight if he behaves well. Philly didn't care that she hardly knew Raffolo. She didn't even care that his name was really Lukacha. She allowed the tear to flow down her cheek as the strategists dragged him away. His one long travel finger pointed to the outer corner of his eye and he saluted her to stay, to say I'll keep my eye out for you. The novices were ushered rather unceremoniously out of the house and led directly back to the temple, but they were stopped by the sudden appearance of the high and mighty senate facilitator who spoke directly to Philly. I will be keeping an eye on you myself, young child. I do not encourage such insubordination, so I will recommend further study of the veritable law as requirement for your graduation. The temple aide bowed in fade, feigned acquiescence. Such extra assignments will be immediately applied to her study hours, sir. Philly, said the young girl clearly to the senator's back as he stalked off. He stopped and turned slightly as she continued. My name is Philly. She smiled in defiance. So you can better keep an eye out for me. The senate members paused and took in all her postured poise. The Senate's usually silent seer spoke. It will not be your name that gives you your fame, child. And as the retinue of ancients oozed their wrinkled frowns back to their offices, the novices were led back to the temple. Secondary Officer Schmidt joined Philly on the temple veranda after supper that night to offer his best and most disciplined consolation. You'll be still graduating early, but your vacation season has been cancelled due to accommodate for your new studies in veritable law. Philly stared off into the skyling's automated blaze of light as it descended the cavern wall and smiled at her mentor. That's good. I have nowhere else to go anyway. Finis, but for more stories to come. <laughs>